Welcome. I am so excited to be talking all about dogs. This is one of my rescues, Sunday. Hi, baby. You were rescued from the streets. And so we are talking about how to rescue dogs from all sorts of situations, um, from being lost, as well as not eating an optimal diet. How can we get them even healthier? So I'm going to let you run along while we talk to some experts. We are so delighted to have Rob Adams here today, and he is going to be talking about a new way to bring your pet home, gpcsmart.com. Absolutely amazing high-tech solution to bring your dog home if your dog gets lost before your dog races out of the neighborhood. So stand by for that. But first, we are going to go to our very special guest. We have two esteemed doctors with us today who have done an extraordinary study. Uh, Dr. Tona Melgarejo, tell us what you have studied in terms of dog diets and what you say you have learned. And I must start by saying, as we do with all medical broadcasts, this broadcast is for educational purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. We obviously do not know your dog personally. Consult a medical professional or healthcare provider before any changes to your dog's diet. That being said, tell us about your study, doctor. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'll summarize um, uh, my study. Um, we uh, included, it, it was a feeding trial. We decided to test scientifically and systematically what is the effect of a 100% plant-based diet in dogs. And we decided to do it with uh, clinically healthy client-owned dogs. We didn't um, use any uh, cage dogs. We used dogs that they were living in um, loving homes here in Los Angeles County. So we uh, had adult dogs from one year to nine years of age. And then uh, all of them, they were being fed at that point, a uh, meat-based diet. So we transitioned in one week from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, commercial available um, plant-based diet that is uh, well-balanced. And we tested that food before um, starting our uh, feeding trial. And then after that week, we followed uh, those 15 dogs for a year. And every three months, we brought back the dog and the dogs, and we uh, did a very thorough physical examination. And then we collected blood and urine, and we measure approximately 100 parameters every single time the dogs were here in the hospital. Uh, and we follow them for um, a year. At the end of the study, uh, uh, we collected all the data. We analyzed. Uh, complete blood count, we, uh, the chemistry panel with all the renal uh, parameters, liver parameters, lipids, electrolytes, glucose, uh, cholesterol, etc., uh, as well as the free amino acids in plasma and the water-soluble and lipid-soluble vitamins. It was a very thorough um, study. In addition of that, we measured some cardiac biomarkers that are associated with uh, uh, cardiac health in dogs. Uh, the results of the study uh, surprised us because we found out that actually the clinically healthy dogs that we started with, they were happy, healthy dogs, uh, most of them from our staff and students here at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Western University. At the end of the 12 months, they were healthier. And how was that possible? Because usually when you go to the doctor, to your veterinarian, they check uh, a set of uh, parameters, a set of um, uh, tests just to evaluate the health of your pet. But in this case, we wanted to go deeper and evaluate not only the clinical, but also the nutritional and the systemic health in our dogs. And uh, we found out that actually they, they thrive, they the dogs thrive on a plant-based diet and uh, some of the parameters at the beginning, for example, vitamin D, that is a very important uh, lipid soluble vitamin, was uh, lower than normal in seven out of the 15 dogs. 
So they, they were vitamin D insufficient. Even though they were clinically healthy, they were not showing any clinical signs. At the end of the one year, all the dogs were uh, within normal limits of the vitamin D. And we, we have uh, talked, well, at that time, we did talk to clients every month and it's, how is your dog doing? Um, do you have any, any concerns, any problems? And most of the clients said, my dog is healthier, is happy, has more energy. The fecal material is very easy to clean. We are very happy with, uh, with the feeding trial. So uh, just to summarize everything, uh, we completed that in a scientific, systematic way. We documented every parameter, everything that we did, and we uploaded this uh, data in a preprint platform so the scientific world and the, uh, any, anyone uh, with an internet can go and check our results. So this is what we did. Um, can I ask you, uh, is it okay to mention what dog food you use? Did you use a commercial dog food? Yes, we, we did uh, use a commercial dog food and um, we had different choices because there are several, not a lot, but there are several choices in uh, in United States that we can actually go and purchase directly from uh, the market. So we evaluated several uh, diets and we uh, sent the diet to a third party, a specialized lab that uh, actually gave us the uh, or analyzed the diet for all the uh, nutrients that uh, they need to be there uh, as a recommendation from the AFCO and the National Research Council. And one particular diet actually passed um, all the results that we wanted to check because we wanted to make sure that we had a diet, commercially available diet, pellet, that actually fulfilled all the requirements before we transitioned the dog. And it was a, a, a pellet uh, version um, and I think the headquarters are in San Francisco and the name of the food is B uh, slash dog, B dog, just for right. uh, to avoid any conflict of interest. Yes. We did not receive any uh, money from B dog. We purchased okay. uh, the food, we purchased the treats because we wanted to avoid any suspicion that oh, uh, B dog paid for your study, therefore you're reporting this. That was not the case. The study cost us close to $200,000 to complete. And every uh, penny came from amazing donors and friends that believe in this study and through uh, fundraising and direct donations from intelligent uh, philanthropists, we were able to finish this. All right. And full disclosure, the dogs you were looking at were not dogs involved in the study. Those are my two rescues. And mm -hmm. Uh, just by coincidence, so they have an EV dog. Uh, so there you go. This is a very important study uh, for quite a few reasons. We're going to get into them, but I think we have a caller already. Uh, Michael, your question or thought for the um, two scientists who conducted this vegan dog food study? Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a great topic. Um, yeah, uh, my store companion is an uh, eight year old Chih Tzu. And we've been together for about six years. And since that time, he's been on a totally vegan diet. And, but about two years ago, during like a routine checkup, um, my vet diagnosed him with a heart murmur. And he began to take uh, daily medication for that condition. And he, he actually has an echocardiogram scheduled coming up. But my vet also mentioned to me that about a year ago, that when his condition wasn't improving, that a grain-free... Uh, food is not good for it. Huh. So, you know, what is your opinion on that? Uh, I will let I will let Dr. Annika Line, uh, who is a, a residency trained in small animal cardiology at, at the University of Pennsylvania, answer your question. So it's it's a great question. It's an important question. So the Food and Drug Administration um, released several um, summaries in the sense of an unusual number of dogs being di uh, diagnosed with what is called dilated cardiomyopathy on what initially was coined the Beck diet. So boutique brands, uh, exotic meats and grain free. So it's been an you can say ongoing conversation. Now, what's important to keep in mind is 
that there hasn't at this point been studies to say what is actual causation. So, and of course, this is, is one you know particular case and, and you have a relationship between you being the client and, and the provider and then of, of, of course the patient, your dog. So in each case, every person has to of course make a decision based on those recommendations. What is important is that dilated cardiomyopathy is something that we typically see in certain breeds. Um, typically we see DCM that has some sort of uh, genetic component. So the Doberman Pinscher is one breed that we see with very high frequency with DCM. Now, the reason that the FDA was uh, releasing these news releases over several years was that DCM was occurring in more atypical breeds. And the conversation has been ongoing. And in the veterinary literature, you'll see again studies um, attempting to try to find what is causation in the sense of saying what specifically is it that seems to be causing uh, the heart muscle disease in, in these particular uh, patients. And you can say that the jury is still out. And of course, some clinicians will sort of be on you know the cautious side and say, well, rather stick to specific um, type of diets that are from some of the larger companies. So um, it's again, it's, it's a conversation that is important to have. And uh, it's, it's something that each individual, of course, needs to have with uh, the, the provider, uh, the individual veterinarian. And what you ultimately end up you know, deciding as, as being the client. But again, you cannot pinpoint and say, you know, this is um, exactly the, the cause in, in these cases. So I think that's a very long story short, but it's an important question for sure. Every dog is different. Of course, this is an opportunity to introduce you to my rescue dogs. This is Wednesday. Dumped at a shelter here in the Los Angeles area. And the shelter was so at capacity, literally turned the person trying to dump the dogs away. Luckily, a rescue group, Forte Animal Rescue, was there and brought this little dog in. And now she is with me. Let's go to another caller. We're talking dogs today and research into a vegan diet for dogs. A new study just out. Um, Nilo Far in Dallas, Texas, your question or thought to our panel. Hi, this is absolutely exhilarating. I can't wait to read the full article. Uh, my question is that the sample for the study was 15 domestic dogs. Um, what was the control? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it, this is a very good question. So after talking to nutritionists from the human side and animal nutritionists, uh, we decided to do the 15 dog uh, study using the dogs as their own controls. Usually when you have to have a very good study, you need to have controls that are uh, gender match and age match. So if you have a three-year-old male boxer, you need to look for ideally a three-year-old male boxer, feed this dog a vegan diet and feed this dog a meat-based diet. However, we decided at that point that we could take samples before switching and transitioning to the uh, plant-based diet and use the same animals as their own controls. And that's perfectly valid and actually make the study stronger because statistically is uh, appropriate and scientifically it is uh, uh, perfectly fine to do that. So their own dogs were their controls. What were the results before the transition? Then one week of a tr transition and following one, one year. So the study um, was designed for the dogs to be their own controls. And then one quick comment, because probably that, that's what, after the paper was uploaded into bioarchives, there's a lot of people that have uh, either tweeted or, or emailed me or comment. Um, and they say, why did you only use 15 dogs? We would love to see a bigger study, 50 dogs, 100 dogs, and 15 dogs, it's, it's a great start. And I, I, I answer and I tell, and I tell them, that uh, for a study like this with all the biomarkers and all the logistics and all the food and everything for a year, and it was exactly during COVID, uh, uh, we ended up spending 200 
a thousand dollars, close to two hundred thousand dollars. So if you you can imagine, if you uh, add uh, probably uh, forty five dogs, you're looking at six seven hundred thousand dollars. This kind of uh, research is very expensive, and that we were very happy that we demonstrated that clinically healthy dogs thrive on a plant based diet. All right, boy, this is a hot topic. We've got another caller, Lindsay in Los Angeles. Your question, your thought about the vegan dog food study. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, my question is, if someone is just adopting a dog um, and they want to try the vegan diet, but they've heard some of these other stories um, about certain conditions that we're, we're discussing here that could happen, um, particularly with the heart, uh, how would, what would be a safe way for them to put their dog on the vegan diet and monitor them to make sure that there aren't any problems? Annika, would you like to answer or do you want me to answer, Dr. Lita? Take it, Annika. Very good. Um, so, of course, as as we, I think, all can agree on, we want to make sure that we are not inadvertently doing something that ends up having an adverse impact on, on canine health. And as you're saying, you want to be very mindful if you're introducing a new dog to your household and a new type of diet. Now, I think what we need to keep in mind and, and not lose track of is there, there have been certain, you could say, type of nutritional frameworks that have been, you know, fundamentally vilified, right? Um, the studies that have been done in context or in, in response to the FDA news releases, if you actually go in, and this is available online, those news releases and the data that was gathered, those were a lot of type of diets containing meats so the conversation, I think, that is very, very important to stress, we're not talking about those being meat-free versus plant-based. If you go to the FDA, you look at the news releases, you actually take time, look at the data, the reported cases, the types of diets and the brands, those were by and large meat-containing brands. So it's not a conversation where we are saying, oh, if you exclude these type of ingredients, meaning the meat from the diet, you know, you're at higher risk. That's, we don't have, you know, those, those type of data and that's not the concern. Now, if you have an individual where you as a client, as an individual, because of this information being out there in the public space, where you have a higher level of concern and, and you really want to make sure to do something extra, of course, there's always the opportunity of, of bringing in the dogs, of course, for more frequent health exams to make sure that if it is an adult individual and it is an individual where you wouldn't necessarily anticipate to hear heart murmurs for, for other reasons. And I'm saying this because you can have the small breed dogs that at a more mature older age may be developing what's called chronic valve disease that is not related to this conversation. Um, so you can do the more healthy, you know, frequent health checks, of course, talk to the veterinary practitioner, make sure they do a thorough auscultation. Of course, you do the, the monitoring on a daily basis, um, making sure that there's no changes with regard to activity level. There's nothing that, you know, makes you worried. Um, and, and that is a way to monitor. Of course, unless there's something that is a cause for concern, you wouldn't typically go in and do more complete type of cardiac work on that somehow there needs to be an, an indication for doing that. All right, I wanna point out that this study was presented at the Western Veterinary Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada in February of 2023. And the Western Veterinary Conference is the largest vet conference uh, arguably one of the largest vet conferences in America with 18,000 people attending. So it's not like we're just talking to people who, you know, who tried this on 15 dogs. This was a scientific study. And, um, you know, your credentials as veterinarians are very, very deep and profound. And normally I wouldn't ask um, the credentials of somebody I'm interviewing, but I think that this is such an important study and it's such an important topic um, that 
it would be good to know a little bit about both of you and where you've been in terms of research and your history um, as part of this discussion. Maybe we start with you, Tona, and then we'll go to Annika. Thank you, Jane. So I graduated from the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City, which happens to be the only accredited university in Latin America, meaning that when you graduate from La UNAM, you can come take the boards and start practicing. Uh, the rest of Latin America and a lot of European and Asian countries, they don't have that privilege. There are very few uh, universities that are accredited by the American Veterinary Medical Association. So I graduated from uh, La UNAM. I came to the States and I got my master's in clinical science and my PhD in pathobiology um, at Purdue University in Indiana. Uh, following that, I uh, did an internship, a small animal uh, medicine and surgery internship at Texas A&M, and then I moved to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to complete a small animal internal residency um, a, at that point. Uh, in between that, I went also to North Carolina uh, State um, because I did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, working um, with Dr. Baden uh, there. Uh, after that, I uh, went to Kansas State University. I work at the College of Vet Medicine. I also work at the College of Human Ecology, um, a, in specifically in the Department of Human Nutrition, uh, doing comparative nutrition for 15 years. So we are very well aware of the uh, a clinical research in humans and in dogs. And six years ago, I was hired as a, a professor of translational medicine uh, here at Western University at Pomona. Oh, great. Thank you. And Annika, Dr. Linde, I should say. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. So my veterinary medical degree was from Copenhagen, uh, what is now University of Copenhagen. So I specialized very early on in clinical cardiology. And here, of course, we're talking veterinary cardiology. I was involved in uh, what we have talked about now with clinical research, meaning client um, client and, and, and dogs, of course, living in, in settings, households, et cetera, that type of research. Um, I was recruited to University of Pennsylvania, and that's where I did my residency and a lectureship in veterinary cardiology. And again, working with what we refer to as, as client-owned dogs, but meaning companion dogs living in normal households, studying various types of naturally occurring cardiac diseases. And I went on to pursue um, a PhD in physiology, uh, immunology, and was uh, um, for some time at Texas A&M at the DeBakey Institute and finished the PhD at Kansas State University. And as was mentioned just uh, before, we also worked very, very collaboratively with the human nutrition department. And I also did graduate work in, in nutrition uh, in addition to the PhD in physiology. And over the years, we have worked uh, interdisciplinary, uh, which led me also to pursue an MPH through the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. So the, you could say the summary of it is that we have a, a highly collaborative interdisciplinary approach uh, to the work that we're doing and, and working on what is a species relevant ethical type of, of research and things that uh, have translational value and things that can do um, something good in, in a bigger sort of scheme of things and, and be of benefit to canine health, uh, human health, environmental health, and, and just makes a lot of sense to, to, to be involved in. Thank you. Okay. And the reason I say that is these two obviously have an incredible curriculum vitae. They have many, many years of experience at top universities. So it's not just two people saying, Hey, go eat vegan dog food. Um, and full disclosure, these are not dogs who were involved in the study. These are my two rescues who just by coincidence happen to eat the same dog food. So you're looking at them eating the V dog pellets uh, that were similar or identical to the ones that are involved in the study. Um, the reason I bring all that up is that, you know, just like when humans go to doctors, how many times has a human doctor said to people, well, you've got to eat meat. Where are you going to get your protein? Because they just reflect society. And so while we certainly say that 
the broadcast you're seeing is for educational purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Consult a medical professional or healthcare provider before any changes to your dog's diet. And we also say that we don't know your dog personally. I'm not a vet. Um, so this is simply a discussion. But it is true that culturally, culturally, um, just like human doctors push, often push meat and dairy on human patients when we know for a fact that it's completely unnecessary for people to eat animals. And many of us are thriving and have better health statistics than the average person who's eating animals. It's the same thing with vets. Um, I've had it. My, my dogs are vegan dogs. I've had the experience with vets where they are just culturally programmed. So have you gotten resistance uh, based on that, uh, Dr. Melgarejo? Yeah, it's a very interesting comment. Uh, we have been teaching our students for decades that dogs and cats are carnivores. And uh, there is scientific uh, evidence, strong scientific evidence, uh, uh, Harvard University, MIT, uh, European universities, not just any university, that they have studied the dog's uh, gastrointestinal system that have documented, they have documented that the dog, it's an amazing digester of carbohydrates compared to the wolf. If you put it in, in a context, the wolf has one, let's say, uh, a, a, a number one in the capacity of digesting carbohydrates. And then when you look at the dogs with everything that they have studied, they are looking at 60 to 80 times more efficiency in the dog system. So we know that the dogs are great uh, starch uh, digesters. Um, so when when you present the evidence to students, there is uh, there's resistance because by tradition they believe that the dog needs meat, and even with it, our colleagues here at the college, the, it's very difficult for them to understand. This is the longest study that has ever been published in the medical literature in the last century uh, uh, where we demonstrated scientifically that dogs can uh, thrive at least for a year with a plant-based diet. But this is just one of the many studies that we need to put out. I have been uh, recommending diets for my patients with uh, um, atopic allergies, inflammatory bowel disease, but those are anecdotal. We need to actually publish these papers, prospective studies to demonstrate that's the case. I had a, a, a beautiful Siamese cat and my cat was for 10 years uh, vegan. Well, may I make a suggestion? Let's leave cats out of this okay. discussion. It's enough <laughs> with the dogs right now. Okay. Okay. We've got another caller. Um, yes, um, Tracy in San Diego, your question or thought for the scientists who published this vegan dog food study. Tracy. Hello, hey, this is Tracy. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, say congratulations, and um, yeah, my dogs, I've, I've had vegan dogs for so many years, um, and right now I'm making my own dog food. Um, I'm using some kibble, and I'm mixing it in, and I'm making my own, um, kind of like a stew in the Instant Pot with lentils and um, grains and a bunch of vegetables. Um, and my dog loves it. I have one dog right now, and she absolutely adores the food. Um, I just kind of wanted to um, get the, the thoughts on that from the doctors. And um, I, I, I'm mixing in the kibble just because I want to make sure that um, any vitamins and minerals that might be missing um, that dogs need more of than humans, because it's human food, basically I'm feeding except for the kibble. So. Um, just wanted some qu some thought about that. Uh, I'm doing it because um, I want to provide um, you know variety because I, I I think you know we're just used to feeding them kibble and feeding the same thing every single day. But you know what? Dogs actually really love variety when you um, start to feed them that way. In fact, my dog loves cucumbers. Her favorite foods are cucumbers, jicama, watermelon. Um, you know, raw food she loves. I mean, she wouldn't even touch her food until I squeeze, you know, watermelon juice or tomato on it. So, um, wow. anyways, just interesting wow. how dogs can develop just like humans. Thank you. Well, yes, uh, vegan 
homemade dog food is is the, all the rage just in general. But what do you make of that? Um, Annika, you want to take that? I think uh, Dr. Melgarejo, I could see he was about to respond. So let's hear his thoughts. OK, all right, doctor. Uh it's an interesting comment and question. Um, as Jane mentioned at the beginning, this is just an informal conversation. So I'm not recommending or supporting that. A lot of clients like to do home cooked uh, uh, meals for the dogs. And there are several companies that actually sell you now the vitamins and the minerals and the amount that you need to put in that diet to try to compensate for the things that the dog may or may not have. Now, in order for me to recommend something specifically, uh, at least here in California, I need to see the dog uh, physically. I need to check the dog, establish a client-patient uh, uh, relationship, and then I can uh, recommend. But I can tell you that uh, a lot of uh, clients and a lot of uh, people are trying that with uh, success. And apparently, uh, there's no... Uh, clinical signs of malnutrition, and you're the best uh, uh, person to judge that. You know, your dog, your dog, if, if your dog doesn't have enough uh, energy, if your dog has problems with the fecal material. Um, one thing that is interesting is that uh, we used to travel a lot outside the United States, and we were very fortunate to be in Latin America and in Asia and in Africa. And I always talk to clients and to people, what do you feed the dogs? And some of the um, uh, responses that I got, it, they were very interesting because in, in Indonesia, I remember uh, this very uh, well-educated person that had uh, dogs and uh, was a dog breeder. He, he mentioned to me, I only feed dogs lentils and chopped alfalfa, dry alfalfa, and I boil them in big pots and that's what I feed all my dogs. Uh, he was not concerned about vitamins and minerals. And I saw the dogs and I saw they were healthy, uh, pregnant female dogs, puppies, all of them, they, they received that diet. Right. This is an, uh, anecdotally, but uh, if you go around the world, it's, it's, uh, it, it varies a lot. I think the dog I'm gonna is- I'm going to jump in. Couple of things. Don't breed dogs. We have a pet overpopulation pro uh, crisis. Yes. Yes. And I don't need a doctor to tell me uh, yes or no on that. Adopt, don't shop, don't breed dogs. What I'd like to see is a birth control pill for dogs, but that's another subject. We're going to take one more call, then we're going to switch to our uh, Pet Finder app, which is just totally cool. Um, yes, Jeff in Venice, California, your question or thought for our team. Hey there, Jane. And uh, I, I have uh, two dogs, one of which uh, has... Um, pancreatitis and so i do make also like tracy i make her uh, homemade food uh based on a, a, a nutritionist that that i've i've seen and um she's doing really great on it it's half kibble um which i get this uh i was recommended to get this hydrolyzed protein uh it's based on tofu i believe uh and and that's supposed to be easier for her to digest and then I add to it uh, some, you know, uh, powder, nutrition powder called Balance IT, and uh, and then lots of brown rice and and stuff. So and she loves it. She's doing great on it. It's really helped her digestion. So I, I fully recommend it. My my question was mostly about, you know, thoughts on hydrolyzed protein and and you know the effect and how how. Uh, you know, effective it might be. All right, hydrolyze, quick one on hydrolyzed protein, then we're gonna move on. Uh, who wants to take it, Tona? Yes, uh, hydrolyzed protein has been used for more than a decade, 15 years or so by uh, uh, pet food companies. And, and usually it comes from soy or any other uh, source. Uh, uh, they call uh, this diet uh, therapeutic uh, uh, diets. And it has been shown that actually it has some positive effect in some uh, conditions. Um, I think if, if the dog has chronic pancreatitis, it is good that you help the dog to digest the, the, the protein. And if you believe that it's doing great, then um, I'm, I'm okay with, uh, with that. Just um, 
I would advise uh, any uh, protein that you buy, just make sure that uh, it's uh, USDA certified because some of the cheap uh, proteins that are hydrolyzed or they come in, in powder, they may come from outside the states and they may have some uh, heavy metals and some toxics that dogs don't need. So uh, just, just check on, on the source of your protein. All right. Uh, stand by, guys. That was a fascinating conversation. We've got more fascinating talk about dogs to come. Okay, so many dogs are lost every year. Many end up dead. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy that is totally preventable. There is a new product that was brought to my attention called GPC Smart. It's a little tag you can add onto your dog's collar. Check this out. It's really, really interesting how it works. One out of three pets will go missing in their lifetime, or 10 million pets each year. Less than half will make it back home. When your pet goes missing, time is of the essence. GPC Smart has devised a modern solution to quickly and easily reunite you with your lost pet. It's called the GPC Smart Safety Tag. With the GPC Smart Safety Tag, whoever finds your pet automatically retrieve the pet's profile by tapping the NFC or scanning the QR code on the back of the tag using your smartphone's camera. The profile contains owner and emergency contacts, as well as current vaccination records and other valuable information. GPC Smart sends out a notification that someone has found your pet, and you'll be reunited with your pet in no time. It's the fastest and simplest recovery method possible. Pet owners can have the comfort of being able to reunite with their pet anywhere in the world. Wow, and you can visit gpcsmart.com to learn more. We're gonna go straight out to Rob Adams, who is the representative for this today. Rob, uh, tell us why you think this is effective. And, you know, I, I hope so, because I don't know about you, but in my neighborhood, all the time, dogs lost, and you see them running by, literally, because when they're scared, they run, you can't catch them. Once they get out of the neighborhood, it's so hard to find them. But if you can grab them and see immediately, boom, there's where they live, that's, that's a huge benefit. Tell us about it, Rob. So... One of the things that makes this in particular so much better is it's meant to replace the metal tags in, uh, in total. Because when you have a metal tag, A, you might have old information on there. And let's say somebody calls you, they found your dog, but you don't answer the phone. You don't know where your dog is still. What this does is you find that you have the tag on the dog. You find the dog, you scan it with your phone, and it pings you that some where the location of your dog is at that moment. So it's not a matter of whether you answer the phone or not. You also could put a secondary uh, person on there if you want somebody else to pick up your dog if you're not available. But yeah, it, it shows it exactly on the map, just like it, uh, Jane's showing, where your dog is. And you can contact the person directly. Um, they don't need to have an app to download. They just use the NFC, which is like what we use for our credit cards, the, the contactless touch. Uh, or you can scan the, the QR code on the back and it'll pop up all information such as maybe uh, whether it has a microchip, uh, vaccination records, whether the dog is going to bite you or not, how to approach it. Um, and it, it reunites you without using the system, uh, like dropping them off at a, at a shelter, for example, which obviously is not a good idea. It keeps it in the community. So for a faster return to owner. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, the, the shelters are in such crisis right now. Uh, I personally have attended two protests demanding um, that the Los Angeles Animal Services, LAAS, um, do something. Uh, the, the, the dog I have literally was dumped at a shelter and the shelter said, oh, we can't take any dogs because we're full. And right. if it were not for a rescuer hearing that from a certified rescue group and grabbing those dogs, who knows where that precious dog Wednesday, my new Wednesday would be right now. So right. one of the problems is, breeders backyard breeders people who refuse to spay and neuter their dogs and uh the general pet overpopulation but another well, is that a lot of lost dogs end up at the shelter and sometimes they're euthanized before the owner can figure out uh yeah. where the dog is so, so the, the, the thing that's uh, very valuable about this is it as a universal pet registry so for example now, speaking of shelters, uh, there's so there's many, many different levels of this. The the tags are for personal, like pet pet parents. I like to say, 
Um, there's different versions. There's microchips as well, which we also would you know say is always better to have your dog microchipped as well as have a tag on it. Um, and there's also emergency responders. Um, you could put tags around, like say if you have goats or you have a sanctuary. It's it's meant to be a universal system where every animal that you have should have some kind of identification and should be able to be found. And actually, one of the things we are trying to do is get these into shelters uh, because of the universal pet registry, which is which we have under GPC Smart. Um, you can have all, even if your dog is microchipped, you can have them in the system and be located anywhere in the world. So you could be in Europe right now and, and it'd be pinged that your dog is now in Bakersfield and, you know, and, and attend to it that way. But we're trying to uh, make it one big registry where uh, because what happens is you go out of jurisdiction with certain licensing. So let's say San Bernardino County has information about your dog, but now they're not there anymore. Now they're in Los Angeles County. Well, the time it takes uh, an animal control to find somebody over there to answer the phone to also finally find the person. And what if you're in a different, uh, you, they would get phone calls back. Your dog might be euthanized in that time. So it's the way to truly, and if you truly care about your pets, which you should obviously, um, to have the backup system on a universal basis where everybody can go to one spot and find the information that you need. Um, <clears throat> well, there you go. Like I said, it doesn't use the resources. It, it saves money. It doesn't use resources that are already over overdone and that have been failing us for so long and you know what i liked about it also it's very light uh yes. now full disclosure my dogs have uh apple air tags right and it's not mutually exclusive um we know that some dogs are bolters okay some dogs have escaped repeatedly run away repeatedly uh, i don't know if you're on for example next door Every time I look on next door, there's a lost pet. Yeah. And then everybody gets hysterical. We're all looking. I can't tell you how many times I've gone at night with a high powered flashlight looking for a dog. And, you know, if you can catch a dog before they get out of the neighborhood, that is the key. But as you said, wherever they end up, somebody finds the dog, just scans this, Boom, it alerts the person whose dog it is on the receiving end. Boom, it's the dog. There's your dog has been found. Where is your dog? You can jump in the car and head right over there. For so, what's really valuable about it in, 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 in the opposite side of the AirPod is it's not battery operated. Um, you, lots of dogs swallow batteries and it is not a good, obviously. Um, you know, it, getting them, um, <clears throat> when you're in an area that doesn't have good reception, your AirPod isn't going to commute it to anybody. So what this is, is on the first net responder system, which is the one that emergency responders use, um, in emergencies. So everything else goes down, they're still up. And so that's another thing that's a huge advantage to this one over what you have out there. Also, this is for everybody. It's not a matter of you have to spend a hundred or a thousand dollars. There's no subscription required this is affordable for everybody um you know and, and Rob, i understand that you're also working with some shelters or some some kind of rescues explain that so there's also fundraising and grants that are available through this you can get uh so we're we are trying to get it into the shelter system so i'm trying to get some meetings down to get some people to talk to legislation like representative ted lou had just made that announcement about making a mandatory um, you know, for spay and neuter and getting these ID microchips and stuff. And we're already ready to go on that. So I'm trying to get it to them to, because this is ready to roll off the, off the racks right now. Um, if you're a rescue, for example, there's different tiers of this. You can get fun. You can do fundraising, uh, <clears throat> without having to come up with the money in advance. You could throw set up a fundraiser. We can help you do that. Set up a fundraiser, uh, get the money, the cost to you would only be $10. So you could charge whatever you want to benefit your uh your rescue or <clears throat> or whatever your sanctuary whatever that it is that you have so the benefit to um to rescues is huge there are grants available to make this citywide for shelters in particular so you can use it for um <clears throat> for example like uh for gear for food for anything that you need it for it's not specifically for uh just one thing you could also uh if you have a promotional like an event or whatever like Unchained TV, you want to have these, say, instead of bring my pet home, say Unchained TV on them, 
they could be personalized to your personal uh, rescue, your company, um, or whatever else you have. But it's the importance is to have it on. There's a lot of options available beyond just the pet owner. Like I said, for so <clears throat> we'd love to discuss. If you want information on that, uh, you can contact. If you want to, me to tell you, or you want to put it up. Right. Uh, GPCsmart.com to learn more. I want to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about the overall issue here of, you know, here it is, 2023, we're building spaceships to Mars, and we still can't figure out the pet overpopulation problem in the United States of America and in leading cities like Los Angeles, um, where there is a pet overpopulation problem and the um there's been it's not me saying this alone there's protests there's rallies there was an overwhelming almost hysterical response when there was a uh the city council held a special hearing on the, the state of the um animal shelters uh, why is it that dr mel garajo we haven't come up with a birth control pill for dogs yet i've heard uh, urban myths about it that I've heard urban myths that maybe, you know, people have come up with a two pill or something. Obviously these are myths. So don't be assuming that I'm saying that, but why the heck not? Well, uh, I'm not a thyrogenologist, a reproduction um, um, expert, but uh, this kind of research takes the money and time, but it's more than the money the, the will to do this and, and probably uh, creating a pill like that would not generate millions of, of dollars. And, uh, and I think that's uh, one of the things. The other thing that is uh, the physiology of a, a dog, uh, it's similar, not identical, but it has a lot of similarities with the physiology of humans. And probably uh, having control on those pills or injections for dogs it's going to be harder when you can uh, miss, potentially misuse them for, for humans. Uh, I believe that if there is a will and there is money, uh, we have the uh, human talent in the States to actually develop that. It may take three, uh, four, five years, but it, it can be done. It's just a matter of, of the, the sponsoring and having uh, ethical, um, amazing scientists working on that. Yeah, I mean, it's just outrageous to me that at this time, when we have accomplished, you know, so much um, that we can't, even in a city like L.A., a, a progressive city, a arguably among the more compassionate cities, that there is no way for us to deal with our pet overpopulation problem. One cat becomes... There's, there's a tree that you can look up online, gazillions of cats, if left to his or her own devices out there, uh, unspayed, reproducing. And so you end up killing a lot of animals. You can't kill your way out of this problem. The solution is to stop breeding, stop giving breeders licenses, and also to come up with some kind of a, a birth control pill uh, for for animals, for, for uh, dogs. I, I think it can be done. I hope it is done. And uh, meanwhile, um, you know, let's get some final thoughts on the vegan dog food study, because one thing we didn't get to is that dogs, American dogs, if they were their own country, would be one of the largest meat-eating countries in the world. So by switching dogs to a vegan diet, uh, and again, I put up my disclaimer. We're not suggesting that this is a discussion only. I don't know your dog. I'm not a vet. Nobody here knows your dog. Go see your vet. But um, the truth is that by feeding animals to dogs, we're killing millions and millions, if not billions of dogs over the uh, billions of animals over the years. Um, and if if it's unnecessary, wow, isn't that unnecessary suffering? I mean, is is that something that we really, I think, should be looking at, doctor? Uh, yes. Uh, with the basic uh, humane principle, you don't have to kill an animal to feed your own animal. And with all the information that we have and with the results of this study, and we are starting another two or three clinical research projects as we are speaking, 
we know that uh, our dogs and cats, that if you put them together, they are close to 200 million. Uh, it's 170 something uh, between both of them. The amount of meat that they consume is not necessarily because the dogs uh, can be fed a uh, well-balanced uh, vegan uh, diet. Um, and now, let me jump in and ask you, because we only have a couple of minutes, what's next for your study? Where does it go from here? You did the presentation at the Western Veterinary Conference in Las Vegas. It is up on, um, you can tell me the name of- Bioarchives, yes. Yes, uh, Bioarchives, is that it? What's yes. next for it? Uh, well, uh, short term, what we would like to do is just to try a plant-based diet, 100% well-balanced plant-based diet for puppies. And we would like to uh, uh, include um, client-owned puppies from three months of age and then follow them until one year and three months uh, and then feed them a vegan diet. Because uh, the question is, well, probably adult dogs can make it, but you you want uh, you don't want to give this plant-based diet to puppies because they need calcium, they need uh, vitamins, they need minerals, they need a high protein. And we would like to actually... Uh, demonstrate uh, scientifically, as always, we, we, we are there for evidence-based data that uh, puppies actually can be fed uh, a plant-based diet. That's the very short term. Uh, the other one that we are, we just acquired a $100,000 machine, a DEXA machine, a dual X-ray absorptiometry, because we would like to really uh, approach in a scientific uh, version the epidemic of obesity in dogs. So we are going to uh, start working with uh, overweight or obese dogs, and we are going to feed them a plant-based diet and follow them, documenting the bone density, the fat content, the water content, the systemic health of these uh, of these dogs over six months to a year, uh, to demonstrate that actually a plant-based diet could be an excellent choice uh, for losing weight. Wow. It's can so I can I add something real quick? Sure, of um, course. I, I'm a dog trainer and I you know normally people use like chicken or something, you know, cheese to for treats or whatever. And I actually use light life um smart dogs. I don't I don't use the meat. And they are perfectly happy with that. They people always ask, what is it that you're using? And my my, my dog loves that. And it's it's just a plant based hot dog that we get that's for us. Um, but I'd rather use that first than anything else. And another thing is when people go back to the idea of dogs requiring, I mean, in the last 35,000 years, their association from a wolf, the DNA isn't even the same. So equating them to the, nat the nature of a wolf and the requirements of a wolf wouldn't be accurate today anyway. Well, um, there are also plenty of vegan treats that I have that are based on peanut butter and all sorts of other uh, vegan products that are commercially available, uh, designed for dogs that, uh, since I'm in the process of training my dogs, when I walk them, I use, and they absolutely love them. I have one quick question, Annika, uh, you'd mentioned that you used V dog and I happen to have V dog, uh, in my kitchen. I use that for my dogs. And when I was opening the package, I saw it says here includes omega three and six fatty acids plant-based DHA, probiotic ingredients, and added taurine. Can you just address that for a second? Because those are some added benefits, presumably. Yes, as, as Dr. Melgarejo was uh, emphasizing, the important point here is we're talking about not, you know, we're not focusing on, on specific ingredients, right? We're, we're focusing on is it nutritionally complete? And that's the point before we started the study. We actually looked and, and for this study, as, as we already mentioned, there was V-Dog. So we actually had a small amount and we sent it to an independent lab again that had you know no interest in saying one way or the other. And we went through the whole process of having an analysis to say, is this nutritionally uh, complete for adult maintenance, meaning adult dogs? And short answer again is, is yes. And of course, in, in this instance, every single, you can say, essential uh, nutrient is from non-animal products, right? So that, that's why, of course, from a marketing standpoint that you see these things um, on the product as, as you're opening the bag. So, and that's important for 
any product that we are evaluating in context of clinical research, the very first, the starting point would be to say, is this actually nutritionally uh, complete? Is, is this adhering to what is recommended, FCO, uh, the guidelines for adult maintenance? All right. Well, Deb Thompson says, thank you for this presentation. And I would like to say thank you all for joining us. It was a very fascinating discussion. Americans love their dogs. And of course, at Unshade TV, we are trying to tell Americans and everyone around the world love all animals. Uh, they're more like your dogs than you know. We're going to see you next time here on Unshade TV. Thank you so very much for joining us and make sure to download the Unchained TV app. It's absolutely free. You can download it on your phone or on your TV. So be a part of the Unchained TV team. Thank you.